All right, so last week, we stopped at the point where Joseph invites his brothers to come dwell with him in the land of Goshen. How many people were here last week? Remember some of that. Okay, I'll just catch up all of you a little bit. The story of Joseph, we have discovered, is God's sneak preview and coming attraction in the Old Testament to the real main event of Jesus Christ, down to very scary details, you know? It's this one big trailer, this symbolic prophecy of the Christ who would come in a millennia or two, give or take a century here or there. And by studying Joseph's life, the point of this, okay, it's not just, you're not just accumulating Bible facts. The point of studying it is that it brings deeper understanding in our heart into the gospel, into its power, into the implications for our life in this present age. Everybody say present age. Very important. Remember that word, this present age, those two words. So once again, Joseph, he's the beloved son who wore the rainbow coat of favor. He was hated and rejected by his brothers, the sons of Jacob or Israel. He was beaten and cast down, but he rose. He rose up from the pit to the highest place of authority in all of Egypt and right next to Pharaoh. But what we have been especially focusing on is the point when Joseph meets his brothers again after rising to this place of authority. They come to him during a time of incredible famine to buy bread, but they don't recognize their brother at first. Joseph hides his identity from them, and he puts on this Egyptian disguise, and at one point he even throws his brothers into prison. But on the third day, he releases them from prison. And then after that, after some more interactions with him and then, where they still think he's, uh, he's scary and harsh and that he's going to punish them, Joseph finally takes off the disguise. And he makes himself known to them. And he reveals that all along he had a plan to bless them. He reveals his love for them. And he says that even his own suffering at their hands was for a purpose. It was to save them and the whole world around them from the severe famine that was to come. And so that is the gospel, to say it for about the 9,000th time. This is what happened between humanity and God. There was a time, and for some, they're still stuck, imprisoned into this time. There was a time that we imagined God to be like the gods of this world. It was this Egyptian veil over our own eyes to keep us from seeing the full light and glory of God. So there's a picture of this, another little parable picture in the Old Testament. Some of you might remember when Moses saw the backside of God's glory, right? He didn't see God's face. God did not allow Moses to see his full face because Moses represented the law. And the law does not reveal the true face of God. The law served a purpose. It was a tutor. It was this big cosmic lesson to teach us that we couldn't figure this thing out on our own. Our independent ways, our self-effort, and that false identity that we had taken on, all of it just leads to death. All of it leads to emptiness. All of it leads to a global famine. And so the law taught us and called us to give up and to throw ourselves at the feet of a Savior and to the truth that he revealed. So in Christ, the truth of God's face came forth. That is what Joseph represents. In Christ, we learn that agape love is at the center of everything. Every judgment, every act of passion in God is rooted in a redeeming and a forgiving love. A love that all along, it turns out, was never keeping a record of humanity's wrongs. Think about that. It is spelled out clearly in 2 Corinthians 5. God was not counting men's sins against them. Do you realize the weight of that statement? But we didn't see this truth until Christ came to reveal it, to demonstrate it. So Christ revealed a love 
that all along was plotting and planning our blessing. Just like we saw Joseph. Remember, he was secretly blessing his brothers. Even when they didn't know who he was and they thought he was against them, Joseph was actually for them, but they were imprisoned in their own guilt and in fear. Just like all of humanity was imprisoned, not seeing the truth of God's heart. So this is a stunning picture of the gospel. And what we found last week is that once we behold the face of our Father and His love toward us, and once we behold the face of our brother, Jesus, and His embrace of us, it is then that we are called to draw near. And what does that mean but to embrace that love? in the deepest places within us. That's what happened with Joseph's brothers. After revealing his face, he asked them to come near. So this is the second part of that 2 Corinthians passage I mentioned. He's reconciled us. He's not counting men's sins against them. So be reconciled to him. He's reconciled you. He's holding nothing against you. His love is totally aimed, targeted. you got a bullseye on your back for the love of God. So... Be ye reconciled to him. Accept it. Embrace it. And then Joseph said to them, Come and bring your whole family. Bring my father Israel. Bring everyone to come and be near me in the land of Goshen. And this we saw was a clear Old Testament picture painted thousands of years in advance of what it means to receive Christ and then live an abundant life in him. Okay? That's where we're going. Goshen, the land that the brothers were urged to come to by Joseph, the ruler, the king, their brother, it was a land of abundance. It was a land of blessing and protection from the famine that was still in the world. The incredible thing that we found was the meaning of the word Goshen, this land of blessing. We found out that the literal meaning of Goshen is drawing near. That's what the word means. So Goshen, New York is about an hour from here, right? It's a biblical name, and it literally means to draw near. And it's from this context of Joseph and the intimacy between him and his brothers. Goshen represents the drawing near to the Father and to Jesus through the Holy Spirit, the whole Trinity. So After this all happens, Joseph introduces his brothers to Pharaoh. I'm still catching you up here. Do you remember what Pharaoh represents? Yes, God. He is a clear symbol for God. God uses many crazy characters to represent himself in the Bible, in the parables, Jesus' parables. Pharaoh represents God. So it's almost like Joseph bringing his brothers to Pharaoh. It's like Jesus bringing his brothers to the Father. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Why? Because he perfectly reveals the true Father of grace and not the false and angry gods of this world. Jesus is the clearest picture of the living God. And no one comes to God but through that that relationship and that truth. So... Joseph brings his brothers near to him, near to Pharaoh, and then he says, come and live in the land of drawing near. Come and dwell. In other words, accept it. Settle down in this place of Goshen. Oh, man. Come and abide joyfully in this realm of peace between us, this realm of confidence in my presence. Now, the land of Goshen was a land described as being the best of Egypt. It was not affected by the famine in the same way that other regions and territories were. So Goshen really does give us a biblical picture Not only for the joy of salvation, but for the prosperity and the abundance and protection that flows from our salvation as we embrace this 
this joyful union. That is what we're going to focus on this morning, okay? Because, well, for many reasons. One of them, the key one, is that it's a main part of the story that God is telling. I'm trying to stick to the text here. What is the story communicating in and of itself? This message, not only of the love and the redemption, the forgiveness, also leads into prosperity and abundance that flows in this life of nearness. So I want you to look at the words of the Apostle John for a moment, okay? John, John's the one who wrote the words of Jesus in his gospel. I've come to give you life and life abundantly, abundantly, okay? But he also wrote this. I want you to see how he greeted other believers, okay? This is a greeting from one of the beginning of his letters, which is right in the New Testament. He said, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. Hmm. I didn't say it. He said it. Yeah. Yeah. So we've hit on this before, this, this idea, but we've got to go deeper in it in light of the story. And we're going to keep reading the story here. We can't skip over the implications of what's being communicated. If we accept the first half of Joseph's life, which I think everyone is very clear about, he was sold for pieces of silver, beaten, thrown in a pit, rose up to become lord of all Egypt. That's literally what they call him. If we can accept that's a picture of the gospel, then we have to look at the second part of his life. And the second part of him and his brothers together. Because that is another parable of the gospel. Saying that once you get the gospel, once you accept it, well, what does it look like to dwell in it and experience it? What this parable of Joseph's life reveals is that there is an abundant, a prosperous, a joyful life in our inheritance, in the knowledge of Jesus and the Father through the Spirit. In that place of confidence in the Father's love, in the revelation of Christ's true identity, which, by the way, is a revelation of our identity, right, as his brothers and sisters, in all of those things, there is this abundance, this overcoming and overwhelming life, and it is abundance in all respects, first and foremost, in our souls. That's our inner life. That's the most important. But then also in our bodies, in our healths and in our health, and in all other things in life, even the things we set our hands to. This is the implication of living in Goshen, which you're going to see more clearly, okay, as we continue through this. So without further ado, I want to read the next part of the story here. And this is continuing to build upon the revelation of Goshen. So I want to look at Genesis 45, starting in verse 10. Um, which we started to get into last week, but we're going to read further, okay? So Joseph said to his brothers, you shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children, your grandchildren, your flocks and your herds and all that you have. Now there it is right there, okay? May you prosper in all respects. In all things, may you be affected by this nearness to me, okay? I will provide for you there. I will provide for you in that place of nearness. Because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. What is he saying? He's like, if you... If, you, if you're not embracing this nearness, if you're, keeping, if you're choosing to stay in famine, you will be destitute. What is that implying? That's basically saying that even though there is a finished work Jesus accomplished, there is a full provision of protection. If we choose to stay in the lie, if we choose not to embrace the truth, and stay out in the famine of this world, we can still become destitute, even though there is a person, a man, a God-man who sits at the storehouse of all bread 
and provides for all our needs. But we can yet still become destitute even in that. Verse 12, you can see for yourselves, he continues to say to them, you can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. So he's trying to convince them here because they're still in disbelief. I mean, you think about this. 15 years later, meeting the guy that you threw into the pit is now Lord of Egypt, okay? It's hard. It's hard to believe. And let me tell you something. The gospel is crazy. I get it. I get that the stuff I say every Sunday is nuts, guys. I get that it's class A crazy. But Joseph pleads with them. He's like, look, guys. He's like rubbing the makeup off. Like, guys, look. It's me. Smile. Remember the family photo, this one? Like trying to, he's saying you can trust these words. You know, sometimes we do. We hear the good news and we doubt that it's really God speaking. We do. We doubt that it's really Jesus. We think, oh, well, this is just a false message. This is just like a prosperity teaching, prosperity gospel, charlatan guy, false prophet giving me this. Joseph is saying, look, no, this, this, this is really me. You can trust this. Goshen is wide open. So, tell my father about all the honor accorded me in Egypt and about everything you've seen and bring my father down here quickly. All right. So last week, we saw how this scene is such a parallel of Jesus rising from the grave, announcing the gospel, the honor and glory that was bestowed upon him after the cross, and then calling people, go, go and tell the good news. But Jesus also said that there would be trial and tribulation, right? Jesus said that. He said, I am ruler over all the earth, like Joseph was the ascended ruler over Egypt. Jesus was and is ruler over all, but there is still a temporary season of famine in this world because not all have eaten the bread and woken up. So like Joseph, Jesus said to his disciples, in essence, you must go to my family, go to the Jewish people and to all nations for all are the offspring of God, and you must bring them to me. For in nearness to me there is blessing, there is life. Even in tribulation and in famine, you can experience life, true and lasting life. This is what the bread represents, life. Goshen was a place filled with plenty of bread. It was the table prepared in the midst of our enemies. A land in the midst of famine, prospering. This is the abundant life. This is what we're called to. All right. Look at the next verse here. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him, weeping. And he kissed all his brothers, and wept over them. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. And when the news reached Pharaoh's palace that Joseph's brothers had come, Pharaoh and all his officials were pleased. Pharaoh, again, he is a symbol for God. God is pleased with the reconciling work of Christ. God delights in it. And the work of Christ is that which embraces brothers. It brings lost family members home. And so here we find again that Benjamin is really a symbol for who? Us. Us. Let's keep going. Pharaoh. Who? Jesus. Pharaoh said to Joseph... Tell your brothers, do this. Load your animals and return to the land of Canaan. And bring your father and your families back to me. And I will give you the best of the land of Egypt. And you can enjoy the fat of the land. Whew. 
you are also directed to tell them, this is a command right here, right? I command you to be blessed. That's, that's, you know, you are directed to tell them, do this, take some carts from Egypt for your children and your wives and get your father and come. Never mind about your belongings because the best of all Egypt will be yours. I love it. For all who believe, all who come near, Joseph says the best is already yours. I want to show you something that Jesus said, okay, in the New Testament. And I want you to see if you can't tell the parallel here, okay? What were those two words I asked you to say in the very beginning? Oh, this is great, guys. Present present time or present age, right? All right, you're restoring some confidence right now. There we go. All right, this is Jesus talking to his 11 disciples. Joseph is talking to, well, Jesus was probably talking to 12. This is before Judas left the scene. But this is Jesus talking to his brothers, talking to his disciples here. And he says this. Well, Peter starts. He says, behold, Jesus, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, this is Mark 10, verse 29. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age. Houses and brothers and sisters, and mothers, and children, and farms, along with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. Do you see what Jesus is saying there? Jesus is basically like Pharaoh here, right? He's saying, look, if you follow me, don't worry about your present belongings. Whatever it means to, whatever it looks like to give up things for the sake of the gospel. And I know many people in this room can testify to the friendships, the family, the things that, you know, when you embrace the gospel, it affects your life. There's a promise saying, look, you have no idea. You think you're giving up all this? I am going to bless you beyond measure in this age, this present age. This is not just about heaven. God sets us in family and relationship, and he blesses us with houses and farms. Now, to a first century person, that has to do with finances and property. But it could also translate to ministry and deep fellowship. There's a whole teaching I could do as far as the farms and houses and how, you know, Jesus is really emphasizing this. But look, what else did he say? What else comes with the package? Persecution. Yeah. So people rail against messages like this. Oh, that's just a happy-go-lucky, candy-coated gospel right there. Well, here's the deal. It's actually an extremely happy-go-lucky, candy-coated gospel. It's actually better candy than you could ever imagine. All is well with my soul, candy. But oh, by the way, there still will be tribulation and persecution with it. And you just learn how to blow bubble gum in the midst of it. (laughs) Really. That's laugh. That's what Joseph said, right? Look, there's still a period of famine that still exists. I get it. Jesus said, look, I know I'm making these promises of abundant life, and you will have tribulation, you will have persecution but you will be blessed beyond measure. You will have bread beyond measure. Okay, let's keep reading Joseph's story, okay? So the sons of Israel did this. Joseph gave them carts as Pharaoh had commanded, and he also gave them provisions for their journey. To each of them he gave new clothing, but to Benjamin he gave 300 shekels of silver and five sets of clothes. And this is what he sent to his father, 10 donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt and 10 female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and other provisions for his journey. 
So I'm going to stop there for now. If you're following along to any degree this morning, I think you're getting somewhat of an obvious picture of the father's heart. God is a dad and he's a giver. That is his nature. That's not something you twist his arm into becoming. That's who he is. He's a provider. And he's head over heels in love with his kids and wants to just load them up with the best things. Do you see that? This isn't just special circumstances related to Joseph and his brothers. This is the gospel, okay? The 12 tribes, the 12 brothers are figureheads. They're representative for the whole nation and for all of us. David got this. David understood this. He's the one who wrote these words. Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. This is who God is, like really. Now, with saying all of this, I need to make kind of a sobering statement here, okay? When Joseph's brothers were relating to him as the Egyptian ruler, when they were seeing him, through the disguise, they were living very far from the land of abundance, right? Now, Joseph did still secretly bless them, right? Even though they didn't know who he was. I'm telling you, that's like the nation of Israel today. They are an economic oasis in the Middle East. The Jewish people are some of the most prosperous people in all the world. They don't even know the full face of God in Jesus, and yet they're so blessed. It's just a picture, even in Joseph, of God secretly putting treasure in the Jewish people's sacks because one day they're all going to wake up and all Israel will be saved. We're going to talk about that next week. Anyway, there was still blessing for them. For us, even when we're not living in the place of nearness, for those with eyes to see. But the fact of the matter is, these brothers eventually would have gone hungry again. They would have needed more bread. And here's how this relates to us, okay? Pay attention to this. When we allow the lies of distance and separation between us and God, or when we have an incomplete, religious, fear-based, Egyptian image of him, when we don't know him as Abba Father, and I mean really know him as Dad, like you wake up in the morning and you just, you know Dad is on your side kind of thing. When you don't know these things, when you're not living in them, dwelling in them, it has a way of imprisoning you, imprisoning mindsets that lead to certain actions and all kinds of stuff. You're going to hear a little bit more about that next week. There are countless people today that have a veil over their eyes, and that keeps them in fear, which blocks them from blessing. Because in their hearts, they believe God is stingy, and they believe that he wants them to suffer, that he is the author of suffering instead of the redeemer in the midst of suffering. So this is sometimes called a religious or a poverty spirit. It's a way of thinking that looks at God as tight-fisted and who enjoys our impoverishment. They might not say it like that. They'll say, well, he impoverishes us for our good. But really, dad, the sweet aroma of dad is not in their hearts. Prodigal son dad, that's what I'm talking about here. So think about the obvious portrait of Christ that the story of Joseph is giving us. It's a picture, it's a portrait, not only of forgiveness, which is a foundational part of the gospel, it is also about a permanent nearness and an abundance that flows from that. This is why David also wrote these words in Psalm 103, okay? Okay. We've all heard this before. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Remember he daily loads us with those things? Right? David wrote that he daily loads us. Now he's going to give you the lowdown on your load. Forget not all his benefits. Who forgives daily Ooh. all your iniquities? who heals 
all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Yeah, you can get excited about that, Jules. That's all right. Come on, man. Really. I'm glad he gets it. Seriously. So what's the first benefit there? Forgiveness. That's where it all starts. That's the doorway into nearness, into Goshen. How can you be near unless you think God's still holding something against you or he's removing his presence to teach you a lesson or something? All this, these the theologies that we build up. All your iniquities. This is the complete gospel of grace. He's holding nothing against you from that. I mean, that is prosperity of soul right there. That's prosperity of soul. To live in the joy of forgiveness and love is to prosper in your soul. From that becomes a prosperity of body. Do you see that? Who heals all your diseases. I looked up the Hebrew word to diseases. This is crazy. Do you know what it means? Diseases. Bodily diseases. Big mystery there for you. Yeah. And he redeems your life from destruction. How many of us live in a fear? I will raise my hand. I fall into this. How many of us live in a fear all the time that things are just going to get destroyed and not work out? You might not say it like that, but that is one of the number one things behind our anxieties. It's this fear that all will not be well. He redeems your life from destruction, daily loading you with that benefit. And he fills your mouth with good things. So here's a question for you guys, okay? Really think about this one. Who, you don't have to answer me, think about this internally. Who are you praying to when you go to the Father for different needs? Some of you are like, I'm praying to the Father. I'm praying to God. Well, are you praying to a tight-fisted, distant God who is waiting for you to shape up or maybe suffer more so that you can prove yourself worthy of his blessing? Or are you praying to Abba? If so, okay, if it, well, I should say, if you're not, you need to understand that that is a false image. And I have news for you. False images are idols. And I have some more news for you. Idols don't answer prayer. Now, look, I'm not saying the real God, your Father, doesn't hear you when you pray, even if you have a false image of Him, but you have to understand something at some basic level here. He is more interested in you waking up and prospering in your soul, drawing near in confidence and grace, than He is giving you certain blessings you pray for or want. Because, look, if you're in a prison, that blessing will turn into a curse in your life. He is way more interested in you seeking first the kingdom before all these other things are added unto you. But make no mistake about it this morning. God wants to provide. And he wants to bless abundantly. He wants us in a Goshen realm. He wants to load our wagons with daily, daily benefits. So... And he wants us to live there. He doesn't want us to make a five-hour, or probably in their case, a five-month journey to go and beg for bread again, plead with God for five weeks that he would come and visit you or something. He wants you to live in Goshen, live in the reality of his kingdom and his gospel. Now, of course, there is still famine in this present age, but understand what famine is, okay? Okay. People are dying spiritually because of lies. And because of that, they're walking in spiritual darkness. And they can bring darkness and death to other people, even to believers. So, yeah, there's still tribulation. There's still persecution, sometimes unto death. But that doesn't mean that death or poverty or persecution is of God, okay? Poverty and death is the fruit of the curse. 
And really, he wants individuals and nations who are blessed to go and help others out of poverty. So I'm going to wrap it up here with Benjamin, okay? I need some more moments of your attention because this is the real gem of the story. Once again, um, Benjamin, the little brother, who is you, okay? He is you. He embodies some of the most important things in this story. Okay? Do you remember what we said about Benjamin two weeks ago? Benjamin was the second beloved son of Jacob. Joseph was the first beloved son. Joseph was the one given the coat of many colors. Joseph represents Christ. Christ is the eternal firstborn of heaven. That's Colossians 1.18 and Romans 8.29. He was the firstborn who was beaten and thrown into the grave only to arise and save us from our sins. He was the lamb. He was the sacrifice prepared by God so that Isaac, so that Benjamin, so that all of us would not have to die. So Benjamin is the secondborn son. He's the second beloved son of the father. And he is thus like Adam. He represents the whole human race. He's the one that was saved from the punishment of that silver cup. Remember the silver cup? The silver cup was placed into his bag, but that was the point where Joseph revealed his identity, did not punish him for the silver cup, and that is a picture of what? Jesus drinking the cup for us, the cup of judgment. The older brother gave his life for us. It's unbelievable how the whole Bible ties together. It's unbelievable. So I want to go back for a moment. I want to show you something that Judah said. Okay, Judah was the brother who fell at Joseph's feet when they were still unknowing of who he was and that he was still afraid and punitive. You know, they were thinking that he was a punitive person. So Judah confessed a bunch of sin, threw himself at Joseph's feet, offered to be his slave, and he said something very interesting. He begs the Egyptian-faced Joseph to let Benjamin go home. And that if Benjamin cannot return to his father, he says, well, then my father's going to die from sorrow if we can't bring Benjamin back home. Because, again, at that point, they were, he thought that Joseph was going to kill Benjamin or enslave him. Re look at Genesis 44, verses 27 and 28 with me. And this is Judah speaking, begging, pleading to Joseph. Your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One of them went away from me, and I said, he has surely been torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. If you take this one from me too, and harm comes to him, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in misery. So now, if the boy is not with us when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, sees that the boy isn't there, he will die. Your servants will bring the gray head of our father down to the grave in sorrow. Now, the actual translation of this, this is a real beautiful thing in the translation that's not totally clear here. It says that the father's soul was bound up with the boy's soul. Judah is saying that Jacob loves his son Benjamin so much his very soul, his very life is bound up with the life of his son that he would die from sorrow if he lost him. He would die. This right here, I'm just, I'm pulling back this curtain. There, this is a little peek into the heart of God. There's, this, there's these little curtains in the Bible, and this is one of them in Genesis 44. It's this, this little thing that if you look into it and behind it, you will see some of the most vulnerable places of God's heart. God has hidden a message within this book for those who want to draw near and understand his heart more. Just like Jacob's soul was bound to his second son, God's soul is bound to us. I wish I had the language for this. He is so united to us as his image and likeness, his very children. His love is so tied to us that God could not bear to see us lost. 
So he sent the firstborn son made, well, we were made in the image of the firstborn son, our older brother, and he sent him to save the younger children. It's almost insinuating that like if we die, God dies, but therein lies the gospel because guess what? God did die with us in Christ, but the good news is death can't hold him down. So his death overcame death. And he brought his second son home to him through Christ. I can barely take this stuff, you know? Really. Like, it's just beyond words. It's beyond words. If you let this soak in, I don't know. So, anyway, in this passage, Joseph embraces Benjamin, right? His younger brother. To totally belabor the point here. We are the younger siblings of Christ, and Christ has embraced us all with his love. He has kissed us. Look at that scripture again. And he kissed all his brothers. The kiss represents the word from the mouth of God. We have been kissed by the gospel. The gospel, the word of grace, is a kiss from God to the sons of Adam. Every last one of us. So what happens next? Well, Finish this up here. He gives them new clothes. He gives Benjamin five sets of new clothes. Now, five is a number of grace here. All right? We skipped over a certain part a couple weeks ago, purposefully, when Joseph had the meal with his brothers. Everybody remember the meal? Had a meal with his brothers? It was before they knew who he was. But it, this happened during the meal. Look at this. Genesis 43. When portions were served to them from Joseph's table, Benjamin's portion was five times as much as everyone's else. So they feasted and they drank freely with him. Oh, I love that. That's our goal every Sunday is to feast and drink freely with the Lord. Yeah, I love that. That's our inheritance, to feast on the goodness of God, the wine of his presence. But obviously, the point of focus here is the number five. Benjamin received five portions of food and later five sets of clothes, five being that number of grace. There's many other places where this shows up. This is about the extravagance of grace that's been given to us. And if anything, if you see anything from this this morning, take this home to the bank. God is extravagant, and he wants us to know the over-the-top crazy love and favor and provision that is centered on us. I know I'm only catching a glimpse of this with my two daughters in their first few years of life, right? I mean, the years when their innocence is like most clearly seen, I'm tasting a fraction of what God feels towards us, right? Right? And I know it's only a small fraction, which blows my mind even more. But it's true, nonetheless. God, see, that clothing is our innocence in Christ. We, I skipped over a part because I want to finish. That clothing is our righteousness. We've talked about that. God sees us as innocent because of what Christ did. We are just as innocent and pure as a newborn baby in God's eyes. And I know that's hard for us to get sometimes. That's why we need to dip into our wagon daily with those benefits that we have every day, eternal grace. But our innocence is redeemed. God sees us more pure than a newborn child. And he loves us more than we could ever fathom. So there's this extravagance to his love and wanting to bless them. And that's all we really need to see here. It is not just hugs and kisses. It's wagons and wagons of the best things of Egypt, five times the portion. Are you listening? I mean, really, 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 really listening. And he gave him how many shekels of silver? 300 shekels of silver. That's a lot of money, okay? Silver is that symbol of redemption. We talked about the silver cup. Benjamin was first found guilty with the silver cup placed in his bag. But then Joseph is revealed and Benjamin is given silver later as a gift. Think about this, okay? 
Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. His betrayal, his near murder, his enslavement began with silver. This is why the silver cup is so important. This is why this whole scene is so important. Jesus took what we did wrong. We all sold him for pieces of silver. We're all Judah and we're all Judas. We exchange the glory of God for a lie, the book of Romans says. For dust. But he turned it around and he blessed us. The silver that punished him was turned into the silver of blessing towards us. 300 shekels. That's 20 shekels 15 times over. Okay, that right there, my friends, is triple grace. Okay? Triple grace. Five times five. Some may call it foolish or impossible, but call it what it is. Call it grace. Dwelling in the nearness of God brings prosperity. And I, I, I don't care if that offends you or whatever. I mean, it's just the truth. I'm declaring the heart of God, but it all starts with nearness. It all starts with knowing his heart. And I believe the Father's challenging us like never before to embrace his goodness in our lives. So in two weeks, on 9-11... That Sunday, we will do the seventh and the final teaching of Joseph. We're going to take a break from it next week, but we will finish it up then, and it's an ending you will not want to miss because there are even more implications of the gospel in this story, and it's amazing because grace is amazing.